for a year. So uh, Thursday at uh, Open Close to a year. Hopefully many of you have uh, interacted with him. Um, Nick completed his master's degree at uh, San Diego State University, where uh, he published seven papers from his master's. So I'm not quite sure how you do that, but uh, Nick managed. And then he completed his PhD with Irby Lovett at Cornell, working on horned larks, which is work that he's extended now as part of his, of his NSF postdoc here um, in the MVZ. So uh, <clears throat> Nick is also extremely accomplished in terms of uh, not just his numbers of papers which exceed 20, but his service to the ornithological community. So for those of you who have been to any bird meetings in the last uh, probably more than five years now, Nick used to run the Jeopardy contest, which is a sort of famous <laughs> event at these bird meetings, um, to great success. And then this year he was awarded the Marion Jenkins Award for service to the um, American Ornithological Society, which is an extremely prestigious award, and to be awarded it as a postdoc is really a phenomenal achievement, and it sort of exemplifies Nick's approach uh, to ornithology. But one of the fun things we get to do when we introduce our own postdocs or students are a few fun facts. And I've got some real juicy ones, <laughs> some which I've decided are not appropriate for this audience. So you can ask me later. The first is, some, most of you would know that Nick completed his, his master's on tanagers. But um, I was just recently learned that when Nick started, he really knew nothing about birds. And one of the first birds that he picked up was a window-killed western tanager, which he then took to Kevin Burns, who was his master's advisor, and asked him, well, what is this bird? <laughs> which seems awfully ironic, given that you ended up doing your master's degree on tanagers. So um, you've come a long way. <laughs> the other thing you'll notice is that Nick's extremely tall, which was a great <laughs> asset when we were in the field. But um, at the same time, I hear that he's prone to bumping his head as he enters doors, <laughs> which may explain why in college he's spend a great deal of time playing rugby, one of the greatest sports of all, even though he supports the English. <laughs> but what you don't know is, is uh, one of his friends wrote to me and said that almost for every day as a freshman, he chugged a gallon of milk to try and bulk up. <laughs> and last but not least, Nick is very enthusiastic about costume-themed <laughs> Halloween parties. And given Halloween's coming up soon, I thought uh, one of his uh, friends provided these two photos. <laughs> Let us hope that we can add to this collection this Halloween. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nick, which I'm sure is going to be an entertaining seminar on board lots. So thank you. <clears throat> All right. Let's get this going here. Great. Well, thanks, Rory, for the introduction, and, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really exciting to have the opportunity to give an MBZ lunch. I've really enjoyed this seminar series since arriving in January, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be able to share some of my work with you all today. And in a lot of ways, coming to Berkeley and Cal is in some ways sort of a lifelong dream come true. And this isn't just me pandering to you all. Uh, I have photographic evidence of when I was sort of an awkward teenager in the junior year of high school on a fishing trip in northern Minnesota with my family. And if we use our CSI skills, we can see that yes, I am in fact wearing a Cal sweatshirt. And so I knew that Cal and Berkeley was something special, even as a teenager growing up in Minnesota. And I've been attracted to Cal and the MUZ in particular for a long time, partially because many of the people had really uh, had, had, had associations with Cal and the MBZ have had really positive impacts on my life as mentors or advisors and as peers and collaborators. So it's really exciting to be able to be here as a postdoc and uh, use this excellent collection and be part of this great community. So I'm not an ichthyologist, as you probably guessed from my kind of dainty grasp on that fish. I am an ornithologist, and I kind of consider myself a biodiversity scientist and an organismal biologist. And to me, what this means is that I'm really interested in understanding the ecological and evolutionary processes that underlie the amazing diversity of birds that we see here. And I've included a lot of staples of biology talks in my talk today, one of them being Charlie Harper illustrations. But this illustrates a you know, nice variation among migratory birds in North America. And I'm interested in understanding this variation both among species, but then also within species, variation among populations, and then also down to the level of individual. And so sort of variation is in some ways the overarching theme of a lot of my research. And in lab meeting on Monday, we were reflecting on dissertation strategies. And I think if you were to look at my collection of papers, in some way my thesis is sort of just 
a mishmash of papers stapled together and turned in. But since it's job season, uh, we're going to abandon that and say that my work is very broad and interdisciplinary. <laughs> so one of the things I'm really interested in understanding is diversification and trade evolution at a really macroevolutionary scale. More approximately, I'm also interested in understanding the process of speciation, how one lineage becomes two, how reproductive isolation evolves, and really, in a practical sense, how we can try to limit species in nature and the implications of that for various uh, aspects of biology. And then more recently, I've become increasingly interested in trying to understand how birds are responding to different aspects of human activity and anthropogenic <coughs> change in the ecosystems. And museums are really central to my entire research program. And I've really, you know, drank, uh, hold on, that's the next slide, never mind. So, <laughs> This, uh, this time scale kind of explains my research from you know, deep patterns of macroevolution at sort of the macro, of deep evolutionary scale across species and across lineages to more recently the work we'll be talking about today with Gordon Larks is really focused on geographic variation among populations, understanding how local uh, that the phenotypes can evolve and how species respond to environmental change. So what I was going to say is that I've totally drank the Grinnell Kool-Aid in that I wholeheartedly believe and endorse this idea of the perspective power of museums. Um, and this idea that you know, not uh, only are museums useful for understanding biodiversity today, but the temporal comparisons that they provide and the ways in which future students will use museums that we can't even perceive of today is uh, really important. And so I'm a big proponent of continued collecting, and it's really exciting to me to try to include this as part of my, um, part of my career. So I'm going to provide an outline for where we're at today, and for those of you who have seen me give talks before, some of this will be um, a repeat for you, but I also have some new data that I'll be showing at the end. But I'm going to provide hopefully an overview of the kind of work that I did as a PhD student and what's led me here uh, to the work that I'm doing today. And so I'm going to start by talking about the macroecology and macroevolution of birdsong at a very deep phylogenetic scale. I'm going to discuss some contrasting outcomes that I've encountered in my own work regarding avian phylogeography and taxonomy. And then finally, through the bulk of the talk, we'll be focused on temporal and geographic variation in camouflage among horned larks in the western United States. So I'm going to begin with this first topic, which is related to tanagers. And so, as Rory mentioned, when I started my master's, I really did not know much about tanagers. And I owe a lot to Kevin Burns for taking me on despite my lack of avian knowledge. And um, this was work that I did in his lab and I'm continuing to work on today. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with tanagers, they're a really remarkably diverse assemblage of neotropical birds. Uh, shown here are 12 different subfamilies, and so there's roughly 370 species of this group of birds. They're all throughout Central and South America, and they're remarkably diverse in pretty much every phenotype you can imagine. And so they're probably best well known for really bright plumages. Um, members of the genus Tangara, shown here, like the Paradise Tanager, are basically like living jewels. And if you haven't seen them in the collection, I really recommend that you check them out just because they're fascinating in their own right just for their coloration. But they're variable in many other aspects of their biology too. And so sort of the goal of Kevin's working group, and I've been a big part of this for the past few years, has been to understand phenotypic evolution using a variety of different data sets on tanagers. And so while I've focused on song, um, so tanagers are also very diverse in their vocal displays. These are spectrograms that are representative of different subfamilies of tanagers. And so you have frequency on the y-axis and time on the x. These are all on the same scale. And so you'll notice that there's a lot of differences in the rate at which notes are given, as well as the structure of these different songs. So there's a lot of variation just in general about uh, tanager songs, in addition to variation in their other uh, phenotypes. And so the idea is if we can combine this data set that I collected on songs with other data sets on tanagers, what can we try to learn about trade evolution in this group of birds? So one of the ways that we're looking at this currently is a collaboration with Amelia Demeray, who is a student in Kevin's lab and is now joining Irby's lab, is to look at uh, bill morphology and how bills might influence vocal evolution uh, alongside body size and other aspects of morphology. And then Allison Schultz, who is an undergrad here at Berkeley and is moving on to a job at the LA County Museum in the near future, collected a really awesome data set on coloration in tanagers. And so one of the things that I'll talk about today is how we can think about color and song might be related in this group of birds. And this is really at its core something that's called the transfer hypothesis. And it was something posited by Darwin, and it's this idea that <coughs> bright colors and the power of song seem to replace each other. And so if you think that song is costly to develop as a young bird, 
or bright plumage is costly to develop and maintain. That there might be a trade-off between these sexually selected traits, such that females might prefer one, but not both, um, if both are costly to develop and maintain. And so we might expect an inverse relationship <laughs> between complexity of two elaborate sexually selected traits. This is really nicely illustrated by the, the bowerbirds. They're kind of the paragon or the poster child of the transfer hypothesis. And so in the bowerbirds, there are some species like the Vogelkopf bowerbird. The male is shown here, which is this kind of drab olive color for the plumage. But it builds this incredibly ornate bower and collects lots of decorations. Compare this to the flame bowerbird, which is very bright in coloration, and builds a very simple bower, which is shown in the background there, just a few sticks really making this alleyway. There seems to be a trade-off between bower complexity and plumage elaboration in this group. And so we wanted to see if this was the case with tanagers in terms of their songs and their plumage. And so we collected a lot of data related to different song and vocal characters, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but we found essentially this mismatch <laughs> smattering of points, right? And so all of these colors correspond to different subfamilies, and the bars correspond to the slope of the relationship between song complexity on the y-axis, so things with longer songs and more notes have a higher score here, versus a color principle component analysis where things with more colors and brighter colors are shown on the right. And you see there's no real relationship here. You can try to squint and maybe talk about how in some of these subfamilies there's a negative slope, but really there's no generalizable relationship between song and plumage elaboration <laughs> in this group, suggesting these two phenotypes evolve independently. One of the other things that I was interested in is thinking about song at a very macroevolutionary scale, which is uh, somewhat rare actually. So ornithologists think about song a lot, and we know that song is really important in terms of species recognition and that differences accumulate among populations over time, and this can lead to reproductive isolation and song acting as a really important pre-mating barrier to gene flow. And it's really important in taxonomy, too, um, related to the biological species concept and how we delimit species in birds. And so we know that at the population level, that song is important in avian speciation. But I was really interested to try to use my data set on many hundreds of tanager species <coughs> to figure out whether or not there are any macroevolutionary associations between rates of vocal evolution and speciation. If we know that song differences are important at the proximate population individual level, does this translate to higher level patterns of biodiversity and species richness among clades? And so the way that we approach this is by using a phylogeny of tanagers. <coughs> and if we have a phylogeny, we can use phylogenetic comparative methods, such as BAM, which is developed by Dan Rabowski, a former postdoc of the MBZ, to try to get estimates related to diversification rate shifts. And we have estimates for each individual tip and we can do this for our speciation, for our lineages, but then we can also do it for phenotypes. <coughs> and we might see that there's coincidence in where these rate shifts occur, in the same part of the phylogeny, suggesting that these may be um, associated with each other, or we might see rate shifts corresponding to different parts of the phylogeny, suggesting that there's no association between rates of phenotypic evolution and speciation. And so here, are, uh, this is a scatter plot uh, from our data set where we have log speciation rate on the y-axis and uh, just for example, the rate at which the minimum frequency is changing among species. And we do in fact see a positive correlation, um, but this is largely driven by three clades that have elevated speciation rates against the background. And so it seems that there are certain clades that have a burst of speciation and in those groups there's also bursts of vocal evolution so that vocal displays are changing really rapidly among closely related species. And to us, this was uh, kind of an intuitive but also important finding because it suggests that song, which we really appreciate as being important at the population level, is also important for shaping kind of higher levels of clay riches and biodiversity at a really macroevolutionary scale. And so implying behavioral evolution, behavioral ecology at the macroevolutionary scale was a relatively novel uh, idea. Okay, so I'm going to move on to this second topic the idea of uh, some contrasting outcomes that I've had in my own work uh, within the realm of alien phylogeography and taxonomy. And the first one I'll discuss are the red poles. And so red poles are really interesting birds. Uh, there are three species that are shown down here. These are birds that occur in the Arctic tundra, and they're granivorous. They often move really long distances in search of food, especially in the winter um, when food sources can be really uh, scattered and kind of patchy. And they're eruptive, and so they'll occur in really large numbers in the winter in places like central New York, where I was kind of first introduced to these birds. So this was work that I did in collaboration with Scott Taylor, who was a postdoc at Cornell um, when I was a PhD student there, and he is now at UC Boulder. And here we have, uh, in North America, 
two species of red pole, the common red pole, and this is an ecological niche model that we generated for this species, um, showing that they prefer high latitudes, uh, but are really pretty widespread in Canada. And then the hoary red pole, shown at the bottom, kind of prefers <laughs> higher latitudes, but again, there's a lot of overlap in their uh, environmental niches and, and their suitable conditions. And these are, these are their breeding <coughs> conditions, of course. And so red poles are interesting because all of the genetic work that had been done in this group had kind of failed to find any diagnosable differences among the currently recognized species. So with respect to mitochondrial DNA and microsatellites, uh, nothing seemed to be able to resolve these species. And so we wanted to use some new high throughput sequencing methods to see if we could shed new light on what's happening in this system. So this is a sampling map with our uh, distribution of species. So we had some samples from Russia, from Europe, of the lesser red pole, which is shown here as the third species that's only in Europe. A lot of samples from central New York where we conducted this study. But we had pretty decent representation of the three taxonomic groups in different geographic regions in the range. And so we used a method called double digest rad seq sequencing to acquire a few thousand SNPs. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in much detail, but if you're interested, I, I'm happy to answer your questions on it later. And so this is a structure plot. Um, so it's good. Some of you understand what this means. But in case you don't, um, so each column represents the probability of an individual being assigned to a population cluster. And so these are our two outgroups. These are cross bills that we included in our study. And when we first collected these data, we were like, maybe we just screwed up. Um, but we actually we were able to differentiate an outgroup. But we found no genetic structure among the three currently recognized species of red pole. And what's fascinating is, remember, for our geographic distribution of samples, we had some from Russia, some from New York. Uh, there's still no geographic structure in, in this population of species, or these three species. And so uh, we also found no outlier loci. So this pattern of genomic homogeneity was really consistent among all of the SNPs that we collected. We also ran some phylogenetic analyses. So this is a multi-species coalescent approach that allows you to compare empirical support for one species or another. So this is a posterior distribution of phylogenies. And we can see that we really can't resolve relationships among these three currently recognized species of red poles. And we had strong support for uh, potentially lumping these species. But this was not a very popular opinion, especially among birders. Um, <laughs> because the hoary red pole in particular, people spend hours in the cold and the dark trying to pick out a hoary red pole from a flock of 100 red poles. And so they're coveted <laughs> items on people's life lists. <laughs> but um, we think you know this might be an instance where there's really a lot of phenotypic variation within a single lineage. Um, but the North American Checklist Committee disagreed, and so they're still currently <laughs> recognized as two species here in North America. One of the things that we did in, uh, in addition to looking at our DD rat seek was to take advantage of our uh, scare quotes common garden um, in that we had a backyard of uh, our <laughs> collaborator who had red poles um, a flock of mixed red poles, including a hoary or multiple hoary red poles, in uh, the backyard for multiple weeks on end. And so these weren't in captivity, but they're in the same sort of environmental conditions. And we we're interested to try to leverage this to look at whether or not gene expression might be related to phenotypic differences in this group. And so our colleague was nice enough to let us collect some of those backyard birds. And we looked at an uh, RNA seq data set that we collected from 10 individuals and took some phenotypic measurements. Um, and I'm just going to breeze through this. But at a very cursory level, we found this really surprisingly tight correlation. I thought this was a mistake at first, but it's actually real. Uh, between bill morphology and plumage principal component analysis, and this is sort of a, an analog of uh, a principal component for many hundreds of genes of patterns of gene expression. And so there wasn't any single smoking gun gene that's like, oh, this is the plumage gene or the bill morphology gene. Instead, there seems to be this really multi-genic pattern of gene expression related to phenotypic variation in this group that we think is worthy of further study. And so we're, we're throwing whole genomes at this system now to try to figure out what's going on. So just briefly, I'm going to discuss a contrasting case study that I recently completed um, as my P during my PhD on Spirophila torqueola. So these are tanagers. And there's three subspecies within this group, the torqueola group in western Mexico, and the moraletti group in eastern Mexico and Central America. And for this project, we use a method called UCE sequencing to look at, again, a, a panel of a few thousand loci. And we found a really different picture here. So this is our structure plot. And you can see that there's two different colors corresponding to different subspecies groups. So we were actually able to resolve population structure within this group, um, which differed from the red poles. And then when uh, 
we looked at mitochondrial DNA, which we're actually also able to extract from the UCE data sets, we found really deep divergence. And when we aligned it to other individuals in the genus, we found that these are actually not each other's closest relatives. They're really distantly related to each other. And so there's one of the subspecies here, and the other is down here. So there's really deep polyphyly within this currently recognized species. And they are phenotypically different, especially among the males that are shown here and here. Um, suggesting that these are different species, and this was in fact accepted by the North American Checklist Committee. <laughs> so uh, we have really con contrasting patterns here, but this sort of uh, illustrates kind of my work that uh, revolves around trying to understand speciation and patterns of species uh, species limits in birds using phylogeography and, and data sets. And I really breezed through that, but if you have questions on them, please let me know. Okay, so I want to get to the, the kind of bulk of what I'd like to talk about today now, which is focusing on temporal and geographic variation in camouflage among horned larks in the western U.S. And so I got interested in horned larks um, as a master's student when I came here in 2011 um, as sort of a pre-doctoral fellowship. And I worked with Rory and Carla, and I got to do a lot of awesome things like go on this collecting trip to the Papoose Meadow. And uh, while I was here, I really started to think more critically about kind of phylogeography, you know, up until then I'd really only been focusing on tanager songs. And so in a lot of ways this summer was kind of formative in kind of defining the direction that a lot of my future work would take. So while I was here for that summer I did a small project looking at mitochondrial DNA in uh, Channel Islands horned lark, and so this is a subspecies, the uh, Insularis subspecies, which is endemic to the Channel Islands. And this is just a haplotype network, and briefly, so the Channel Islands populations are shown in yellow, orange, and red. And you'll see that they occur in two different parts of the haplotype network, suggesting either multiple colonization events or a really recent colonization event and incomplete lineage sorting. Um, but really, this got me thinking about horned larks as uh, an interesting taxon. And I realized that there was still a lot that, be, that could be done with this group, and that there's just rampant geographic variation in this group, which is something I've become increasingly interested in. So horn marks are extremely widespread. They're on five different continents, and I've shown their distribution in this figure down here. Um, so they're on Africa, South America, North America, Europe, and Asia. And there's over 40 subspecies of horn mark within what's currently described as a single species. Um, and they have a really recent common ancestor. So this is just a time calibrated phylogeny. This is maybe you know, one and a half million years to the recent common ancestor of this entire distribution of birds, which is remarkable in a lot of ways, that they have so much geographic variation, and they've been so successful at colonizing different parts of our planet. So this got me thinking about horned larks, and uh, I'm still you know, working to try to resolve this phylogeny. Um, this was kind of a big part of my dissertation. I'm still trying to wrap up, partially because the samples were hard to acquire uh, from all of these different regions. But hopefully more on that later. But if you read any species account on horned larks, um, you'll encounter something really quickly. So this is just from Handbook of Birds of the World. And you know, one of the first, the absolute first things they say is that there are numerous races described over a vast range based mainly on differences in size, ground color, and pattern. And then if you look at other works, so uh, William Bailey was a PhD student here in the late 30s and early 40s. He worked with Joseph Grinnell and Alden Miller, and he, his work was on horned larks, and he, you know, the, one of the first things, this is in the introduction of his work, the frequently observed similarity between dorsal color and tones of certain races of the soil color lead me to believe that natural selection is playing a role in the system. And so, if you ask any birder, you know, there's this sort of obvious, um, I'm sorry, there's this obvious association between horned larks and the soil. But what I'm really interested in is trying to drill a little bit deeper to try to figure out what exactly is the relationship in geographic variation in dorsal plumage and horned larks and the environmental conditions in which they exist. And so, horned larks, um, I always get really jealous whenever I see people's field site photos because <laughs> horned larks occur in kind of boring sites, to be honest, in some ways. This is, um, you know, Columbia's amazing, don't get me wrong. Columbia's an amazing country, but, you know, many horned lark habitat look like this, sort of just these open fields with uh, little to no vegetation. And this is actually more vegetation than I'm used to seeing. Um, but this is fairly standard horned lark habitat. So they really like open, broad landscapes. And they nest on the ground in very tight affinity to the ground, very terrestrial. And so they seem to have a tight association 
to environmental conditions of the soil wherever they occur. Um, this is just an example of, uh, they also occur in a lot of agriculture areas, which I'll get into a little bit later. But again, you know, you can just by looking at the bird, you can kind of see this similarity between dorsal plumage and color of the soil. And the idea of camouflage is, is not new and has been really celebrated in evolutionary biology. It might be a little bit hard to read, but this is the far side. Uh, and this is Harold. Harold is wearing this kind of interesting pattern to answer the door of the monster and gets eaten immediately while his partner Lola um, <laughs> blends into the chair there and is totally fine. So camouflage is, is not a new idea. And uh, you know, it's provided some really important kind of seminal examples of natural selection in, in the peppered moth and in other systems. Many people here at Berkeley are working on different aspects of camouflage and coloration from the work on pocket mice that Michael's lab has done, as well as uh, work on the white sand system done by Brie Rosenblum and her colleagues. And more recently, Ammon Coral's really fascinating work on the Uda Stansbriana variation in the uh, lava flows. And this is really cool. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend checking it out. There's a lot of people here <coughs> thinking about Crypsis, particularly in, this, in respect to color matching. And color matching is just kind of one aspect of how camouflage works. There are other ways in which camouflage uh, can be achieved, and one of the ways that it's done is by existing against a complex background. Right? And so, Where's Waldo illustrates this really nicely, and that the idea being if you're trying to pick up on a visual cue, it can be really hard if you're against a complex background. Right? He's, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one kind of cool bit of natural history I wanted to share with you all about horned larks. So horned larks also achieve this in their nesting sites. And so this isn't work that I'm doing, it's work that a colleague is doing, Devin Deswan and Kathy Martin at University of British Columbia. They kind of found that horned larks build these net open cups on the ground, and you'll notice that there's this kind of litters of dirt and clumps of rocks here and moss, and this is actually accumulated and placed there by a female in order to increase the ornamentation and sort of the visual complexity, presumably, of the nesting site. And so horn larks are, you know, uh, somehow aware of this, and they manipulate their nesting site in order to try to minimize the chance of detection by visual predators as much as they can. Here's just another cool example. So all of this stuff down here is litter that was accumulated by a female nesting horn lark and placed there to try to uh, minimize detection of this nesting site. There are a lot of really cool other examples of background matching. Um, cephalopods, I think, are my favorite in terms of not just you know color matching, but also pattern and texture. Cuttlefish provide a, a really cool example too. And so, if you let a cuttlefish acclimate on a different environment, they will actually change um, the patterning on their dorsal side to match that. It's pretty phenomenal. And there, there they are. And so. In birds, I think a lot of attention is spent in terms of avian coloration, focusing on really the bright, flashy colors, because uh, that's, I think, what attracts a lot of people to birds in the first place, or the bright, beautiful plumages of many of our favorite species. But birds actually have some amazing examples of camouflage, and I would argue that camouflage in birds has actually been sort of understudied um, relative to other aspects of avian coloration biology. So that's kind of where I'd like to focus for uh, my postdoc. And so this is a nice example of an eastern screech owl, rock ptarmigan, and this is a uh, caprimulgin and nightjar. If you can, it's actually right here. You can see its little face right there. So there's amazing examples of camouflage in birds, and I feel like it's somewhat underappreciated and understudied relative to camouflage in other systems. So this is a, a figure taken directly out of my application to NSF to come here, and this sort of shows, you know, what I think is pretty market, market you know, um, associations between the dorsal coloration and the substrate in different parts of the region. This is a map of all of the samples that we have of horned larks at the MBZ. Each of the different colors is different subspecies. And so we have phenomenal sampling of horned larks. We'll talk a little bit about why that is in a second. And this is sort of a schematic showing, you know, in my ideal world, I would just <laughs> photograph the larks, get the remote sensing data, and bam, beautiful. Association. <laughs> um, so the reason why we have such a great collection of horn larks is really thanks to these three people. And I just want to give a shout out to them and to all the people that have worked to build the collection here because it's, it's really phenomenal and it, it, it deserves uh, acknowledgement. So William Bailey, again, he was a, one of Joseph Grinnell's last students, I think, before Grinnell passed away. He also worked with Alden Miller. 
His uh, thesis has provided a lot of inspiration for my own work and a lot of specimens that I've used to measure. Ned Johnson, before he passed away, collected an amazing series of larks, including a, uh, across an elevational transect from the floor of Death Valley to Mount, uh, to Light Mountain, really the highest peak of the Sierras. And then Carlos Cicero has also been uh, phenomenally uh, helpful and uh, productive in terms of collecting the larks and, and helping me formulate my ideas. So with the rest of the, the time here I'm, uh, regarding horned larks, I'm just going <coughs> to briefly describe how I'm characterizing geographic variation among subspecies in the western U.S. Uh, we'll examine associations between dorsal and substrate color, and then also that idea that beyond just coloration background matching, there's also perhaps pattern matching in the dorsal plumage of birds. So this is sort of the photography setup. You've probably seen me photographing birds if you walk around the museum a lot. Um, and you're welcome to come check out how um, it works. But we, we had to get a camera modified by shipping it off to England to do this full quartz calibration, which allows it to actually take in wavelengths beyond what most cameras can uh, take in. But we then include a scale bar and white standards. And in addition to taking a photograph in the RGB, so this is like the visual spectrum, that we can perceive as humans. We also take a photograph in sort of the UV range. Um, and it appears red because only the red sensor is really detecting light from the camera. But this is actually capturing light that's within the UV range between 320 and about 380 nanometers or so. So birds are tetrachromats. And so it's important to consider sort of the avian visual perspective when we're thinking about can these birds detect larks. And unfortunately, larks are really kind of boring in the UV spectrum. Um, they don't really have a ton of reflectance here. but um, other birds, you know, really show UV patches that, that uh, light up under this kind of camera condition. But the idea is that, you know, once we have this, we can measure the scale bar and measure the standards, and this allows us to control for um, you know, linearize our photos across uh, photograph uh, episodes. And then we can measure by taking, uh, creating these poly, uh, yeah, these, these shapes of these different regions of the bird. So I'm really going to be focusing on the crown, the nape, and the back for this work. And so I did this for, um, I'll go through this first actually. So in terms of patterning, I was going to show, unfortunately my I had an animation here that I was going to show, but I had to, um, it's not going to show up here for whatever reason. But so one of the things that uh, I'll be applying is this fast Fourier transform. And so this is a signal processing algorithm that's that gets tons of use in a wide variety of applications, everything from telecommunications to medical imaging, anything that involves a signal uh, often involves a fast Fourier transform as a way to sort of take apart uh, a really complex signal, like maybe this wave that is shown here, <clears throat> and break it down into its sort of core components that are then added together to create this really complex signal. And so we can use this to look at the patterning of birds, and that if we imagine we can look at, uh, if we create sort of a binary black and white version of this, uh, dorsal plumage, we can look at different frequencies or sort of granularities of sizes and see how much energy is produced. And that will give us an idea of uh, sort of the amount of patterning that we have in a bird. And so, uh, so far I've collected about, I've done this for about 200 birds where I've collected images and analyzed both the uh, coloration and the patterning. And so here's the scatter plot of just the first two principal components. And the first thing that pops out is that there's a difference between males shown in purple and then the females that are shown in red. <clears throat> and we've known that there's definitely dichromatism and differences in patterning between males and females. With these axes of variation, this uh, essentially suggests that females, on average, tend to have more patterning on their dorsal side. But there's still a lot of variation in terms of darkness and lightness, both within males and females. And it actually, um, so yeah, so here's just an example. So these are just typical males and females that I've shown here. Females generally have a lot of patterning, especially in the crown region, but also in the nape compared to the males, and basically the entire dorsum relative to the males. And this is important in terms of their natural history and their breeding biology. And so in, in horned larks, females only uh, incubate the nest. So the males don't incubate the nest at all. And so I think this additional patterning helps with disruptive uh, camouflage and break up the body of the outline as the female is sitting on the nest trying to protect her eggs and avoid uh, visual detection. So uh, I think this animation is also not going to show up. But um, I also broke this down by subspecies. And so you can see there's some clustering of subspecies. 
uh, in that, you know, these purple ones, which are the Utahensis subspecies, all kind of occur here. So these are the, the females down here and the males up here. But there's also a lot of overlap, and there's a lot of variation within each subspecies. And so, you know, these are not like super clear, distinct clusters. Um, and I think this, in some ways, illustrates differences in terms of geographic variation and camouflage and horn larks relative to other systems, <clears throat> in that, you know, these are not just discrete morphs of, um, you know, melanic variants. Uh, this is really a continuous gradient of variation in melanin based phenotypes. But I thought I'd just share some kind of uh, examples. So um, when I wrote this application to come here, I actually thought the differences were going to be more severe and more impressive. So I was a little bit surprised to know that this is just a little bit more subtle and nuanced. Uh, but I think that's still um, a lot of what we see in nature. You know, I think uh, we've tended to focus on systems where we have really dramatic changes in phenotype. But a lot of cases, I think we might see, you know, so this is the darkest female from the data set that I've collected so far. And this is the lightest female. And so this is not, um, you know, as sort of dramatic as like the pocket mice in, in Michael's system, or some of the other systems where we've seen melanic variants like the Udistans Brianna system. Instead, it's sort of a, a more gradual gradient of change between the two extremes. These are the same thing for the male. So again, this is the darkest male, and this is from the subspecies that we have in the Sacramento Valley, versus uh, the lightest male shown at the top, which is from the desert. So there's variation in patterning, and really this is, so this, this came out as the individual had the least amount of patterning among the females, and it's also actually the same individual that was the darkest. And so there seems to be a correlation between individuals being dark and having less patterning, and it makes sense because this sort of bright uh, contrast that you see on the crown really comes out when it has a lighter base to the plumage. And so that's, these are just sort of extremes of uh, the phenotypes that I've measured so far. This is uh, the male with the least amount of patterning. You can see this is completely uniform back, essentially, compared to this male up here, which has a lot of patterning, especially on this part of the rub. And so there is appreciable variation both in uh, darkness and in patterning. But I wanted to try to get at, you know, is this related to anything to do with the substrate color? And to try to get at this, at first I was going to use uh, Landsat imaging. And my idea was that, OK, if I have reflectance of the bird, I can just get reflectance of the place where they found the bird. It'd be great. Um, but that's actually pretty difficult to do. right? And so if you think about soil, there's a lot that goes behind soil. I've got a new appreciation for soil now. <laughs> and so there's a lot of different variation in soil. And the, what makes up soil is, in a lot of ways, related to the climate and the sort of geology of the region. And so when I was first trying to use Landsat data, so this is an example of sort of the pipeline I was doing. I would have my one coordinate where the individual was collected. Uh, oftentimes, this would occur like in San Jose, what is now San Jose, from a specimen that was collected back in like 1910. <clears throat> and so trying to figure out you know, what is the appropriate measurement for that bird in terms of the soil was, was actually quite challenging. So I ended up abandoning Landsat and instead, I used this other remote sensing data set, which was from um, uh, what's called the WISE 30. And so this is a, a data set of soil conditions that was really kind of, I think, uh, intended for use in agricultural studies and trying to understand biogeochemistry. But it actually has a lot of relevance for ecological questions as well. And so it's a global data set at a resolution of 30 arc seconds and uh, is really quite useful for anyone thinking about how soil might influence their system. And so you can extract a lot of different data sets. And this is data that were acquired from looking at you know, soil cores. And we have things such as physical aspects, like the uh, coarse fragments, the amount of <coughs> fragments that are greater than a size of two millimeters, all the way down to things that are way more related to chemistry that I'm only sort of starting to understand. Things like uh, the pH of the soil. Um, but if we do a principal component analysis based on the coordinates where I extracted uh, the soil data set from, the two things that really come out <clears throat> are the amount of organic carbon and the amount of calcium carbonate. And this actually has a lot to do with uh, related to soil color. Um, organic carbon is, uh, provides this kind of rich, dark brown color that we see here in calcium carbonate, which is in a lot of limestone and a lot of sands from the desert, it actually has this lighter color. And so if I combine these two data sets, so plumage on the, on the y-axis here and then soil on the x-axis, we actually do see a positive correlation <coughs> between 
uh, lightness of the soil and lightness of the bird's dorsum, right? And so this is expected, and I breathed a really deep sigh of relief when I saw this because it's like, oh, thank God, there's actually something here. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll be really interested to kind of dive deeper in to try to figure out, you know, what's driving this. It's, but at a very broad scale, you know, our intuition is correct that there is definitely an association between uh, the dorsum of the bird in terms of the coloration uh, and the patterning and also the environmental conditions where that bird had occurred. So uh, I'll just talk briefly about some of the inferences I've gained, and this is really uh, stuff that I've only just kind of gotten to this week, so this is very new. Um, so if you have insights or input, I'd be happy to hear it. But one of the things that I've found is that if uh, we dive a little bit deeper, it, there's variation in the soil conditions in terms of the number of, or the percentage of coarse fragments, and that this is positively correlated with patterning on the back. And so this is the idea of background matching with respect to pattern. That Horn larks that have more patterning on their dorsum occur in soils that have larger, coarser fragments. And sort of the inverse of this as well is that areas that have more silt and kind of more clay rich soils tend to have birds that have less patterning. So this is, um, to me this is exciting because it means that uh, a data analysis is actually picking up something that's ecologically relevant about the horn lark plumages. And a lot of the applications of these methods so far have not been done to uh, bird specimens. Uh, they've been focused more on eggs. Uh, because of a lot of complications with working with birds in that sometimes, you know, they have patches of their plumage that are, um, have been shot, <coughs> or they're just like, for whatever reason, were prepared in a way that makes them difficult to measure. So I think it's kind of an exciting application of, of some of these new technologies. <coughs> yeah, so this also has relevance for a project that I'm just going to briefly talk about. And so one of the areas that I've been working on recently is the Imperial Valley of California, and it's a really <coughs> odd place. I, I encourage you to visit it if you've never been. <laughs> but it's uh, right on the border of Arizona, and it's an agricultural hotspot in the center of the desert. And so this is sort of what a typical scene in the Imperial Valley. You have a mosaic of uh, fallow fields and active fields where they're growing soy, melons, flowers, all variety of crops. And there are horn larks in this area, and so horn larks are native to the desert land surrounding it, but then they also occur in the agricultural land in uh, the Imperial Valley. And so we collected uh, a series of horn larks as in Phil Unit and I, so Phil Unit's <coughs> at San Diego Natural History Museum, and compared uh, the plumages and found that the contemporary larks shown on the right, and we collected them during while they were molting, so they look kind of crappy, but um, these birds that are on the right are contemporary birds that are collected sort of uh, in 2014, I believe. And we found that they're substantially darker than their historical counterparts. And so in some ways, the work that I'm doing now, uh, looking at the importance of, of soil conditions relates to this, because what we think is happening is what used to be the desert and would favor sort of the sandy phenotype has now become agricultural land with much more organic content from the um, influx of, of agriculture and has led to favoring of darker phenotypes among larks in that region. We also looked at, uh, I'll briefly just talk about this too, but with that same series of specimens, we also see shifts in diet. And so it might be not only that uh, the change to agriculture is influencing their coloration, but also their diet. And so this is a, a plot of stable isotopes, and we can infer from N15 in particular, sort of the trophic position of horned larks. And if we compare N15 isotopic ratios of our contemporary larks to the historical ones, we see that the contemporary ones are far lower down here, suggesting that they may be eating more seeds uh, and fewer insects than their historical counterparts. And that you know, could largely be due to influx, again, in changes of soil and um, influx of various nutrients and, and turnover in terms of the insect and plant community in that area. So uh, this work kind of you know, reemphasizes this idea of the, you know, whoever collected those larks back in the early 1900s probably did not anticipate that we would be going back and collecting them in the same region and really emphasizes this idea that uh, museums are really great uh, for establishing historical and contemporary baselines into the future. And so really I've just presented some kind of preliminary data from uh, the work that I've done here so far and I'm really eager to drill deeper into this to try to uncover what's really driving these sort of broad scale associations between soil and plumage principal component axes. And really what I've shown here is Gloger's rule, and you, you're probably familiar with this, and it's the idea that uh, birds in more arid environments, or organisms in arid environments, tend to have lighter plumage, <clears throat> as opposed to birds in more mesic, kind of humid environments, have uh, darker plumage. And this could be for a variety of reasons, like Gloger's, Gloger's rule is the pattern, but not necessarily 
describing the process that leads to this variation. So it could be that there's uh, thermoregulation is also involved, and that's something I haven't really talked about at all. Um, but the idea that there might be changes in not just camouflage, but also thermoregulation is something that uh, I find intriguing, and Eric Riddell and I are going to try to tackle this by examining not just variation in reflectance within uh, the visual spectrum, but also what's happening in the near-infrared and other parts of uh, light being reflected, and how there might be trade-offs between these things leading to the variation we see in horn lark. All right, so with that, I just want to thank uh, the Bowie Lab Group and the MBC community. It's been really great uh, to be here. It's been really exciting so far. Thanks to the MBC staff for helping me get settled in and everything that they're doing. Collaborators that uh, I've worked with over the years and the funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <coughs> Okay, if somebody wants to hit the light, uh, we have time for questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I guess in any field or anything, there's going to be a lot of habitat heterogeneity, and it actually looks like these things are aggregating uh, grass matter and stuff. So do you think that, I mean, I guess, first of all, is there any evidence that a lighter lark knows that it's lighter? And uh, is able to get lighter twigs to uh, be around its nest. And secondly, um, do they pick, like in the field example, do they do darker larks pick a field that is well uh, matched to their color? Yeah, that's a great question, and one that I would really like to, to look at. Um, I'm, there's no evidence, I think, that larks are aware um, of their own plumage and how that matches the substrate. But I, I think in other systems, there's been worked on plovers recently showing that nest site selection um, actually has been sort of demonstrated where well, they'll, they'll pick a nesting site that has more visual complexity. But I don't know if, I don't think it's been demonstrated that birds tend to favor sites that would be favorable in terms of camouflage. I think it'd be, it would, the, horn, the horn larks in the Imperial Valley would be a great way to test that though, because you could go out, collect a bunch of larks, immediately measure the substrate that they're on, and compare that to you know a random sample within the region and see whether or not it's closer than you might expect by chance. Yeah, that's what it seems like if the hypothesis is that selection on female, nesting females and their pattern is the main thing, that you, I mean, if they're putting a ton of energy into making these little nests and breaking up the outline, it, you'd think that selection could act on them, realizing that they're a lighter lark and getting lighter toys or something. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great to look at that. Super cool. Going kind of piggybacking on that, has there been any like banding stuff done where we can see like nesting site fidelity, if it's also, or if it's passed on to the offspring? Does that not that I'm aware of? Um, larks are pretty hard to get in nets, and they're hard to ban. Um, so I don't think there's a lot of work done on lark banding in general. I mean, during the breeding season, they're really um, phylopatric, and they really defend their territory quite vigorously. Um, but across seasons, I don't think we know much in terms of site fidelity. Um, that would be really interesting to look at, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you were collecting in the Imperial Valley, did you stay only to the agricultural sites, or did you also try to collect in the more arid environments uh, directly adjacent to it? Yeah, we, we tried to get larks from the desert. Um, one of the difficulties of working with horn larks is they're just really patchily distributed. And so we tried um, <laughs> pretty hard and had some kind of long days where we were just trucking in the desert without seeing anything. Um, it would be great to get them, but they're surprisingly sparse. Uh, they actually seem to prefer the agricultural land, perhaps because, you know, there's just a lot of food, a lot of resources with all the insects that um, the agriculture brings in. Right, because so, my, my thought was thinking that in like a triple piggyback is that if, <laughs> if you had, if, you know, if you were collecting from such close sites and it did end up matching up with the, the patternings and the backgrounds. The lighter birds were in the lighter substrate, the darker birds were in the darker substrate in such close proximity. Yeah. Then you might be able to get sort of toward an answer to how they're matching with their substrates or why. Yeah, yeah, totally. But I work with you so I know how hard these things are to get. <laughs> yeah, they're not easy to work with. Yeah, sweet. So horn larks are great. One of the things that's cool about them are the horns. Yeah. And the facial variation, the patterns of the face vary tremendously among the subspecies. You stuck with the back. Yeah. What's going on with the 
What's going on with the head and the face there? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is variation, um, uh, even among North American species, like yep. the Arcticola has like a completely white face. Um, that's definitely a thing, and I think it, you know, it's, it's something to consider. This is just sort of the first pass of what I think is the most conspicuous variation in, in larks. And, you know, I think um, they have this kind of counter shading thing, almost like a metal arc, right, and that they have this bright patterned face, and I think that could be important with, uh, you know, potentially some aspect of courtship displays. Um, but I haven't quantified that yet, but in addition to dorsal photos, I'm also taking lateral photos, and so I do have photographs that could be used to quantify patterning and coloration in the face as well. And that would be really interesting to look at. Yeah. yeah. You didn't mention the predation. What, what sort of predators are important here? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. So, I mean, they're, they're being eaten by hawks mostly, so like occipiters and um, other raptors that are visually oriented, so um, yeah, avian predators. Nick, I wanted to ask a, about the red poles. Yeah, um, sure. So what's known about mating uh, patterns between the, the two species that look so uh, identical genetically? Yeah, there's been a <coughs> contrasting reports actually, so it's kind of interesting. And I think someone really needs to go into the high Arctic in northern Canada and really figure out what's going on with the sort of mating in the group. There's some evidence that they co-occur and <coughs> breed assortively among phenotypes in Norway. There's also tons of anecdotal evidence of mixed pairs in Alaska. Um, <clears throat> I think the jury's still out, and we don't necessarily know, and it could be variable in different parts of their range, too. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that I think there's uh, mixed pairs, and I think, you know, our genetic evidence suggests that there, if there is a sort of mating, it's incredibly recent, I would say. It, I mean, it almost looks the way you described it, like polymorphisms within a single species, which, of course, is a great situation for getting at the genetic basis of the phenotypic variation. Yep. Yeah, and that's something we're hoping to do. We think it's going to be difficult, though, because, um, you know, these, these aren't Mendelian traits. There, there's a lot of continuous variation. It's probably going to be a complex network of gene regulation involving a lot of different moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that the low background genetic differentiation makes it a good system for trying to figure that out. That's a very neat system. Other questions? All right, let's thank Nick for a great talk.